Grace and peace, and welcome to another episode of Your Week with St. Luke's, our weekly podcast from St. Luke's United Methodist Church in Orlando. And we are in our, our teaching and sermon series, Dysfunctional, where we're looking at uh, dysfunctional relationships uh, in the Hebrew Bible, in particular, in Genesis, uh, and how we can learn from the characters uh, in, in these stories and their dysfunctional behavior and, and be more functional and, and our behavior and how we live into our faith as disciples of Jesus Christ in our family, in our workplace, and, and all of our living. Uh, and this week, I'm really excited about uh, the text because it's one of my most favorite, two of my most favorite characters. It's the story of the twin brothers, Esau and Jacob. Uh, and it comes from Genesis 25 uh, and and chapter 27. And Dr. Evie Arnold is going to be providing a lecture again from uh, Emory University's Candler School of Theology, specifically Foundry at Candler. And we're so excited to have her back again this week as we learn more about Jacob and Esau in Genesis 25 and 27. Hello, friends. And thank you for joining me yet again as we look at some of the characters in the book of Genesis. More specifically, as we look at these characters and their relationships, both the good and functional and the not so functional. In this study, we've certainly been learning that the problem with most of us is we're like the rest of us. And I think that that's what these characters in Genesis remind us is that these are very human relationships with fallible, erring humans, and there is both good and room for improvement. And when we can't look at a character as exemplary, we can certainly look at some things as cautionary. And so scripture provides us both. Today, we're looking at the characters Jacob and Esau. And you remember last week, we looked at their parents, Rebecca and Abraham's son, Isaac. Now, remember, one of Rebecca's hangups, one of her dysfunctions is that she is very uh, direct and in charge with everyone except with her husband. That in that particular relationship, she doesn't show up really as her authentic self. And today, I think we're going to see something somewhat similar in her sons, particularly with her son, Jacob. But first, before we get into that, let's just give a quick description of the story itself. Jacob and Esau are twins, and Esau was born first. Now, the Bible tells us that he is named Esau, or often called Edom, because of his red skin. He was red, he was hairy, uh, whereas Jacob was very smooth, uh, clean cut. Isaac was a man of the field and the woods. He was a hunter. He was kind of a man's man, as we might say, whereas Jacob was a little more domestic. He liked to stay in the tents and be close to home. Now, Rebecca, as soon as the twins were in her womb, they were quarreling, and it was like there was this constant earthquake inside of her. And she went to the Lord and said, what on earth is going on? And God reveals to Rebecca that it's actually her younger son that is going to become the greater, who's going to sort of be this, this conduit of the promise. So Rebecca already has this notion in mind. And so when the boys are born, it is somewhat odd in the story that Jacob takes what might seem like the more demure or the lesser role. He's certainly not this masculine presence like Esau is. And yet Rebecca knows that Jacob is the one who is going to inherit this promise. Now, Jacob, being like his mother, is also incredibly cunning. And one day Esau comes in, of course, from the field. He has been hunting all day, sweaty. And Jacob has been cooking some lentils and baking some bread. And Jacob realizes that he has leverage, that while he may not be as physically intimidating or commanding as Esau, he does have these abilities to provide for himself, even when times get really tough. And so he ends up basically tempting Esau out of Esau's birthright. Esau is so hungry that he is willing to give up his birthright for this bowl of lentil soup. Not only that, but Rebecca helps Jacob to outwit both Esau and Isaac and trick Isaac into giving Jacob the blessing instead of Esau. 
because Isaac's eyes are so bad, Jacob dresses up in Esau's clothes and Rebecca straps animal hides to him to make him feel very hairy and to make him smell also like Esau. And of course, after Esau finds out that he has been tricked out of his birthright, tricked out of his blessing, he is so angry that he is planning to kill his younger brother. So Rebecca hatches another plan to get Jacob as far away out of danger as she can and sends him to her brother. Now, here's what I find very interesting about this story. The beginning descriptions are that Jacob stays in the tents, close to home. Esau is a man of the field, this hunter, this adventurer. What's very interesting is Jacob leaves his family as his, at his mother's bidding and goes to find his uncle who employs him to become the keeper of his flocks, to tend his sheep and goats. Of course, Jacob ends up marrying uh, both of Laban's daughters as well as several of his um, maidservants. So what's interesting is Jacob, in changing his course, he actually ends up being more like Esau. Esau was this man of the field. He was this man out with the animals. And that is what Jacob becomes. Now, the description we get of Jacob at the beginning is that he stayed in the tents and close to home. And what the Bible tells us is that while Jacob left his family and was gone for uh, several years, probably close to two decades, it was Esau who stayed close to his parents, who stayed in the area where he grew up. And so Esau becomes the one staying close to home. Now, here's why I find this very interesting. These brothers essentially switch places and they try on each other's lives. Jacob, instead of being close to home, goes far away. Instead of staying in the tents, becomes a shepherd and a nomad. We also find out that instead of always being the trickster, he would also be taken advantage of by his uncle Laban, and he himself would be the one who's been tricked. Interesting, it's once Jacob knows all these things, once he's become this man out in the field, once he's become the tricked instead of the trickster, the interesting thing is that's when he's willing to go home and face his brother. Likewise, Esau, after staying close to his home and parents for so long, when Jacob finally comes home, Esau, rather than fuming and being furious, forgives his brother. It seems that the dysfunction that they had at the beginning had something to do with a lack of understanding what it really was like to be the other person. And as soon as they tried on each other's lives and positions in the families, it seemed that they had a lot more empathy for each other and space to extend forgiveness and blessing to one another. Indeed, when Jacob returns and faces Esau, rather than fleeing from him like he did at the beginning, Jacob essentially offers Esau his blessing back. And Esau is able to accurately look around and say, I already have so much. God has blessed me. Now, here's what we can learn also, not just about the living in another person's perspective, although that's very important. But it's important for us to look at how the relationship ends, or rather how it shifts after these brothers are reconciled. Of course, uh, Jacob comes and gives all these gifts to Esau, and Esau wants Jacob to stay and says, uh, I know you have to move on and, and, and handle your flocks, but come back and, and live here and stay close to me. And Jacob doesn't do that. Jacob actually says he'll come back, but he actually goes and he lives somewhere else. So I think what this can signal to us is that love and forgiveness aren't always the same thing as intimacy. That although they are reconciled 
to one another, although they don't bear any grudges, although they're not operating out of hard feelings, that doesn't necessarily mean that super close intimacy is the best idea for this particular pair of brothers. Scripture tells us that they both have these massive families. They both have all these flocks and herds. They are both men who have their own way, so to speak. And perhaps they understand that living too close together might actually set them up for repeating some of these hardships and some of these difficulties. And so they live apart and not close together. But what's very interesting is they continue this pattern that we saw with uh, Isaac and Ishmael in that when Isaac dies, both Jacob and Esau come together to bury their father. So they can be united for common purposes. They can extend blessing and love to each other. And yet the boundaries that they've placed around their relationship in order for those good things to remain means that it is not an intense intimacy. They are not all up in each other's business and lives. Now, that doesn't mean that there are some relationships that work very well that way. But I think it's, it's interesting and it's helpful to notice how we have this example of that it's not always the same and it's not always healthy. And that in order to truly love someone, that doesn't mean we have to take vulnerability to its highest level. There are lots of people that we love. In fact, the story of Jacob and Esau has a wide range of people. Jacob loves his wives and children, but that relationship looks different with all of them. Jacob and Laban will, event, will form a covenant and will say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to set boundaries and we're not going to cross these boundaries so that we can each live our lives in peace and not in fear of one another. Jacob loves his parents, yet he hasn't seen them in several years. And so we have a wide range of relationships that are dysfunctional and functional, but that doesn't mean that it looks like this certain everybody all together, all the time, lovey-dovey, uh, no space between us. And so this particular pattern of coming together to bury their father is a perfect example of how they can be reconciled they can love, and yet they can also live their own lives as they see fit. Now, please remember, this is just one example of how a relationship can go from being dysfunctional to being functional. And there are all kinds of ways for this to happen. But I think that it's important that we look at this particular one and see what it has to offer us. I hope that uh, Jacob and Esau have given you some things to think about as you consider your relationships of the boundaries that we have in them and how those things can be blessings as well. That boundaries aren't always ways of keeping people away, but that they're ways for us to actually be together and to be joined and united in common purposes. I hope you'll join me next week when we look at the last set of characters in our Genesis study, Joseph and his brothers the sons of Jacob. Thank you and be blessed.